Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Jacobson, and I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. And this webinar is about this textbook that uh, was just published by Cambridge University Press called 100% Clean Renewable Energy and Storage for Everything. And this is a this is the culmination of my life's passion and work. Uh, and it's a textbook that, well, for this webinar, what I want to do is kind of describe the textbook for maybe for 15 or 20 minutes. And then there are a lot of questions that have been asked ahead of time that I'll try to get to and answer some questions. And then you can add additional questions during the webinar. Um, you can send in additional questions. I'll try to answer the whole thing. Uh, we should be finished by 11. I think it stops automatically at 11. So it would be about a one hour total. Um, so first, I just want to talk about what what inspired me uh, to write this book. You know, you know why. You know, what inspired my career path to actually get to this point. Uh, it started when I was really young. I was about 13 years old, and I would travel to Los Angeles and San Diego to play tennis. And it was very polluted back then. And still, San Diego, Los Angeles, is still the most polluted city in the United States, but it's much better than it used to be. But back then, it was really horrible. And I thought well, why should people live like this? Why should people breathe such bad air and be subjected to this? And so I thought at that time, you know, I thought maybe in my future career, I would want to study this problem. And it turned out later, yeah, when I went to college, I went to Stanford University as an undergraduate, I thought this is what I want to focus on. And however, there was a problem. There was no major in air pollution. And I was also interested in climate at the time, although that wasn't as big of an issue as today. Uh, but there wasn't a way to study it. There was no major. There weren't many courses. I did end up take, I did end up majoring in civil engineering uh, because that was the closest there was to anything I could study in air pollution. Uh, it turned out that there was a professor there, Gil Masters, uh, who was an amazing teacher. And he taught two courses relevant to what I was interested in. And this, and he, so he was one of the inspirations and he had written, uh, he's written six textbooks over his career. Uh, one of them at the time that I was uh, using as a guide was call, called More Other Homes and Garbage. And it really was about how to live a sustainable life. And I learned a lot from that. And uh, he later wrote a book that also inspired me and is, um, I've used actually as a resource quite a bit uh, called Renewable and Efficient Energy System, Electrical Power Systems. And it turned out, so I took, well, I took those classes. There was no major at the time. I ended up doing a master's degree in environmental engineering at Stanford as well, which was groundwater pollution was still not air pollution because there was no master's even in air pollution. I ended up going to UCLA to finally study air pollution and climate more and to learn computer modeling because I figured I needed to understand the problem before the problems of pollution and climate better before I could come up with solutions. So I ended up um, studying and learning how to computer model air pollution and climate. And I ended up building from scratch almost a, an air pollution model for Los Angeles um, with the help of others. And eventually when I left UCLA and I became a professor at Stanford in 1994, I then expanded that to a global climate model, uh, which had a lot of details in it. And I used the urban and regional and global models to study air pollution and impacts, their impacts on health, the impact of air pollution particles on climate. In particular, particularly, I looked at the effects of soot particles. Uh, soot contains black carbon and brown carbon and other chemical components and found that black carbon may be the second leading cause of global warming after carbon dioxide. Uh, from, but so I was working a lot on the problems, understanding these problems better, climate and pollution. But then in around 1999 to 2000, then I started looking at solutions. Uh, the first solution was because the Kyoto Protocol had just been um, signed but not ratified in 1997. And, the United States was looking to see can um, should US actually ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And so I started looking at wind energy, whether wind energy alone could help solve that problem. And so I opened up one of the my course notes from 1984 in, in one of Professor Masters' courses and found this convenient formula for 
that he had come up with to gives you the efficiency of any pretty much any wind turbine in the world as a function of just three parameters. And that we use that to apply it to a modern wind turbine and to calculate how much um, and then how much energy can be obtained from uh, a bunch of wind turbines in the US and if we could satisfy the Kyoto protocol. We ended up writing this paper together, Gil Masters and I, that was like three quarters of one page, the shortest paper ever, uh, that it got the greatest amount of feedback I've ever gotten because it was called exploiting wind versus coal. And it really questioned whether um, whether we could, re it actually suggested that we could replace a lot of coal with wind in the United States and satisfy the Kyoto Protocol. But anyway, one thing led to another and I started working more on uh, wind energy, hired a student to look at uh, wind resources in the US and we developed a, a world wind map. That was Christina Archer. She developed the basically the first world wind map from data alone, from soundings and surface data. And, and we did a lot of work on wind and then uh, Fast forward, we looked on a transmission, and then in 2008, I started looking at, well, can we combine not only wind but other renewables together to, um, you know, what, well, I wanted to look first at what are the best technologies for solving the air pollution and climate problems. So in 2008, I did a review study looking at this issue, what are the best uh, solutions, uh, not in terms of cost, but in terms of all their impacts. and at that time, and then we compared like wind and solar and geothermal and hydro, but also with nuclear and coal with carbon capture and biofuels. And based on that study, I determined from this kind of scientific result that, well, in terms of the externalities, using just wind and water and solar power technologies, so that's onshore and offshore wind, uh, solar photovoltaics, concentrated solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal, wave power, these were the best technologies among all. Not that others weren't, you know, reasonably reasonable or uh, close, but these were the best ones. And if we want to solve the pollution and climate problems we face, that are huge. I mean, seven million people die from air pollution each year right now worldwide, and the climate problem is growing uh, tremendously, and it's, it's already been a problem for a long time. And so if we wanna solve these problems, we really need to focus on the best technologies. And so that's kind of how the wind, water, solar technologies came about was that review study in 2008. From then in 2009, uh, I worked with Mark DeLuke from UC Davis at the time, who's now at Berkeley as well. And we did a study in Scientific American that uh, looked at, can we actually power the world entirely with just wind and water and solar power? Uh, did we have enough, was there enough land, was there enough resource available, materials? Uh, and we looked at just basically, uh, could we keep, keep the grid stale, not detailed studies? But the conclusion was, yes, it's technically and economically possible to power the entire world with just wind and water and solar, but there are social and political barriers. And we thought at the time, well, we looked at, can we do it by 2030? Uh, and we said, yes, it's technically possible to do it by 2030, but because of social and political barriers, it will probably take longer, maybe by 2050. And in, in retrospect, we didn't realize it at the time that that was the source, that paper that came out, it was on the cover of Scientific American, was the source of the Green New Deal idea for the US, uh, which was 100% renewables and by 2030, although we did caveat it that we didn't think of actually happened by 2030. But it doesn't mean you can't strive for that. So anyway, we fast forward, we did some more papers looking at uh, pollution, well, the solving pollution and climate and energy security problems for states, we, New York State, California, Washington State, then all 50 US states. And then uh, countries, we looked at a hundred, ultimately 143 countries, and we've done many city plans. Um, in 2011, uh, I helped co-found with uh, Mark Ruffalo, Marco Kraples, Josh Fox, uh, with a nonprofit called the Solutions Project, in which we combined these science-based plans with uh, business and culture and community to try to educate the public and policymakers about these plans. And so that led to a lot of policies ultimately that have been put in place and also a wider movement that we call the 100% renewable energy movement. 
So how does that relate to this book? Well, this book is really the culmination of all this information, uh, looking at can we, uh, looking or com combining all these energy plans that we've, been, we've developed uh, and the science behind them and looking at is it possible to power the world and what do you actually need to do to do that? What are some of the steps? So the structure of the book is as follows. I mean, there's an introductory chapter in which we look at what are the major problems, which are air pollution, global warming, and energy insecurity. So kind of describing those problems. Then the second chapter looks at, well, what are the technologies available today to solve these problems? Namely, the wind, water, solar, energy generation technologies, and also some heat generation, like geothermal heat, solar heat, and also storage technologies. There's electricity storage technologies, uh, heat and hot and cold, uh, well, heat and cold storage technologies, and hydrogen storage. And also looking at the grid, looking at energy efficiency, and also uh, what can you do to power your own home? For example, what are the technologies that you'd use in your own home? What are some of the appliances, electric, like heat pumps, electric vehicles, uh, LED lights? It, like induction cooktop stoves, electric dryers, or even heat pump dryers now. Uh, so what are all the, you know, what are the appliances? I mean, even going to electric leaf blowers and lawn mowers, because we need a combination of transitioning the energy generation, but also appliances and to make them more efficient. And also, can we uh, solve the problems for in the industry? Like, what do you do for steel production? What do you do for concrete? Uh, production, how do you transition those to 100% renewables? Is, it, is that possible? And and then, of course, energy is about, causes about 75 to 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions and about 90% plus of air pollution. But what about non-energy emissions? So there is a section in chapter two about dealing with non-energy emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutants. So then, you might ask, well, why only wind, water, solar? So chapter three addresses the question of, yeah, why don't we include other technologies that are outside of those? And this is kind of what differentiates this book maybe from other books, which will encompass, will give you all of the above. This is very focused on what we call clean renewable energies as opposed to just clean, but not renewable or just renewable, but not necessarily clean. And so yeah, so we focus in chapter three about why don't we include the others? And the main the bottom line is not that it's we're against there's not like a a bias. It's more as I mentioned, we have a very short amount of time. I mean, we do need to solve the climate problem, uh, eighty percent of it by 2030, and 100 percent no later than 2050 to avoid 1.5 degrees of global warming. And air pollution, as I mentioned, kills seven million people a year. So we can't wait 15 years to start the solution. And so we need things that are, are deployable rapidly and are low cost and are have very few side effects. So this is why we focus on clean renewable energies, things that we know work that are effective and efficient and don't cause side effects. So anyway, chapter three discusses non the things that we don't include. Chapter four uh, focuses on just the electricity, just normal electricity, so because this is a, academic book. It gives you basics of electricity. Uh, chapter five goes into solar, uh, solar photovoltaics primarily, it describes photovoltaics, but also looks at uh, solar resources, also looks at uh, tilting and radiation transfer in the atmosphere, so more, some more technical aspects. Uh, chapter six is on wind energy, onshore and offshore wind and looks at, at how wind turbines work, uh, looks at uh, wind, time, wind turbine efficiency, how to calculate capacity factor from a wind turbine, uh, looks at things, in, impacts of wind turbines on the atmosphere, on uh, hurricanes, for example. How do, if you have a lot of offshore wind turbines, how do they affect hurricanes? And also, what's the saturation wind potential of the world? I mean, if you just keep building out wind, because there's competition among wind turbines for available kinetic energy, it's you know there's some limit to how many wind turbines you can put up before you add one more turbine and there's you can't extract any more power. That's what we call the saturation wind potential. So there's things like that. 
that are covered. We also look at birds and bats uh, impacts. Uh, chapter seven really then gets into the nuts and bolts of how to develop a 100% clean renewable energy roadmap for a city, a state, a province, or a country. And that, yeah, so kind of was some step-by-step -step, uh, analysis of that. And including, we look at costs of energy, and there's also, we look at not only the energy costs, we look at the social costs. So there's social cost analyses, how to do social cost analyses for air pollution and also for carbon. And because all our costs, we look at externalities in addition to the cost of energy. We want the full social costs because policy decisions are theoretically based on social cost analyses, not private cost analyses. So they're based on uh, including the health and climate costs, which are the major social costs. There are others that we don't include, uh, but the health and climate costs are so large that um, it really doesn't change conclusions by adding other social costs. Now, so chapter eight then gets in, can we keep the grid stable? Because, well, so chapter seven is talking about trying to develop a plan and determining the number of wind turbines we need, solar panels we need for a country or a state or a city, but in the annual average to provide annual average uh, energy. But what about matching power demand continuously over time, very high temporal resolution? So then we need techniques to keep the grid stable. So that's where you're combining generation, storage, demand response, transmission distribution come into play and efficiency come into play. And so that's what chapter eight is about, is trying to keep the grid stable. And then in there, we summarize our roadmaps for 143 countries that were uh, completed recently in 2019. And so, okay, so then finally in chapter nine, it, that's about, well, part of it's uh, my personal journey, part of which I've described a little bit of, of how, um, yeah, how I came to, to to come to these, uh, this book in the first place, but also in these energy roadmaps, uh, and, but also kind of what has happened, what are the policy implications of not only these roadmaps, but the, all the push to 100% clean renewable energy? What are some of the laws that have been passed? What are some of the transition highlights in countries that have transitioned? And also then what are the policies that are needed to go further? And so it talks about the policies needed. And also what are some of the things that are roadblocked currently or things that need to be overcome. So that's the concluding chapter is chapter nine. Um, a few more things about the book. There are some, it is a textbook, but it's also for general audiences as well. Try to, it's trying to mix, combine uh, academic book, but it's something that a lot of uh, professionals and general lay people would be interested in hopefully. But um, in terms of a textbook, it does provide, for example, examples, color figures, and tables. There are homework problems in the back of the text, and there are solutions available from the Cambridge University website. There are also exam questions, example exam questions, not in the book, but available from the Cambridge University site. There are you know, key terms are highlighted in the book. Uh, there is a recommended reading list at the end of each chapter. So it has kind of normal pedagogy features. Uh, and oh, it's also used, well, I, I developed this book actually specifically um, as part of a course. It was the culmination of a lot of work, but I also decided when I just simultaneously with writing the book, I thought, why not uh, create a new course to teach at the same time? And then the book would, be, would follow the course and vice versa. And so I, I taught the first course on this two years ago two springs ago, and so I'll teach it again this coming spring. Um, so there is, and these courses are taped and they are available online, although they're not conveniently yet available online. Hopefully this coming spring, uh, by then we'll have uh, some modules from the actual course that will be available um, publicly uh, that um, can be accessed pretty easily. There is a 2016 set of three uh, classes that I taught online that are available from Stanford. Uh, but um, anyway, this new course, hopefully the full course will be available um, soon. And one more question I'll answer before getting into the actual questions that you guys have. Um, they, people ask, well, what's different about this book compared with other books? Um, so I mentioned 
you know, Gil Masters' really good book on renewable and efficient electric power systems. So that's a very outstanding book that um, I learned a lot from and, and millions of students can learn from. Um, this differs in that it focuses on just the clean renewable energy solutions and so it doesn't account for all solutions. I mean, it doesn't account for all technologies or it specifically doesn't include all technologies. So because we, as I mentioned, we do want to focus on things that we know will work in the shortest amount of time. And it also looks at how do we get to 100% clean renewable energy and storage for everything, whereas I'm not aware of other textbooks that do go that far and actually look at developing energy plans for states and countries and also keeping the grid stable. Uh, so it does have a kind of shift in focus towards not only looking at the technologies and the science behind the technologies, but also really focusing on the solutions and how we get to the practical solutions and the policies needed for those solutions. So I think you'll find this is quite different uh, in the end from a lot of other books, although there are some overlap, especially when we look at like the electricity system or just wind and solar, how to wind and solar uh, works. So let's um, move on because I know there are a lot of questions that were asked in advance and I'm sure there'll be more. Um, so I'm going to just answer questions uh, as they come up uh, on the chat. I'm not sure if you can see them, but I'll read the question before I answer it. Um, so the first question I have here is, uh, please discuss how climate change impacts WWS, that's wind, water, solar, energy generation, and how you, you've incorporated that into your modeling. In particular, please discuss the recent Princeton University study showing that PV in hot, arid parts of the world will be particularly effective. Well, so to answer that, um, yeah, climate change is changing weather patterns, and wind, water, solar obviously depends a lot on the weather and on locations of like good wind resources and uh, temperatures because solar photovoltaics are uh, their efficiencies are affected by temperature. Uh, so there's expected to be a shift, for example, you know, there'll be small shifts of where winds are located, but for example, the Great Plains, you're going to ha still have really good wind resources. So you might get shifts along the edges of, you know, fast and slow wind reg regimes, but the overall Great Plains will still be very fast. Um, but to answer that question specifically, so in chapter uh, seven, where I developed these 100% clean renewable energy roadmaps for uh, 143 countries, uh, the wind and solar resources for those were derived from climate simulations for 2050. So in those simulations, I accounted for uh, 2050 climate with increased greenhouse in impacts of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases and soot and everything else. And so there, you know, there was a change of the weather and the climate in 2050. However, there was still a huge resource of wind and solar available, especially uh, when you sum it up over the whole world. Yeah, there are some locations that they'll be worse and some that will be better. But overall, you're not going to, you're not de depleting wind and solar resources. So I don't think that's a big issue, except in certain places, it could be an issue. Next question is for organizations without space for on-site generation, any guidance regarding pros, cons, recommendations regarding RECs, which is renewable energy credits unbundled or bundled, VRs, that's a verified energy, uh, that's verified energy um, credits, uh, green energy programs through utilities and power purchase agreements, including virtual ones. Um, so the, well, the main question here is, uh, yeah, if you don't have room on site, can you um, use like a renewable energy credit? And my philosophy is that if you're actually producing new clean renewable energy, like a new solar farm, a new wind farm, uh, then that's good. So, for example, Stanford University, where I work, uh, you know, there's not a, they have they have purchased 120 megawatts of solar photovoltaics. They have 10 megawatts on their rooftops, and they purchased they bought or built basically by paying money to build two solar farms in the Central Valley, 150 megawatts and 160 megawatts. 
So that's if they didn't spend that money, those solar farms would not be built. So even though they're not producing all their electricity on site, they are producing electricity elsewhere in the state that's offsetting their grid electricity use. So I think that is good. Um, however, there are other types where if you're purchasing something that is maybe reducing carbon but not reducing air pollution, I don't think that's good. So for example, if you're going to produce, uh, have a renewable energy credit for landfill gas, which would be good for reducing carbon, but then you burn the landfill gas uh, to produce electricity, you're still creating air pollution. Uh, so that's not as good as if you weren't creating air pollution. However, if you're using the landfill gas to uh, produce hydrogen by steam reforming, which is not a combustion process, but a chemical process, and then the hydrogen is used in a fuel cell for transportation and which the only emissions there are water vapor and possibly some leaked hydrogen then that would be probably the best use of the methane instead of burning it so i think the rule to me is if yeah if you're eliminating uh, carbon and you're eliminating air pollution uh, then some kind of renewable energy credit is fine but otherwise it's a little suspect especially if it's things like um, you know, storing carbon in the ground where you don't know if it's actually going to stay there, it could be released later, you know, that's a little iffy. Uh, next question, do you think the U.S. power system needs to be nationalized to be able to get to 100% renewables fast enough to meet the scale of the climate crisis? Uh, no, I don't think it needs to be nationalized, uh, but the federal government can do a lot more than it is currently doing. There are, there's a lot going on at state levels, there are at least 14 states and territories that in the United States that have 100% renewable either laws or executive orders effectively. Uh, but that's only in the electric power sector. We do need all the other sectors because electricity is only 20% of all end use energy. So we need transportation, building, heating and cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, fishing, military. So we do need laws. And I think the best types of laws are renewable, por renewable portfolio standards or even like mandates like electric vehicles a certain percent to be by certain years um, which uh, yeah so i think there are some policies that are better than others so it's a, a strong policies certainly spending new president elect of the united states joe biden has uh, committed to spending two trillion dollars on basically clean renewable energy or in four years which would be amazing since you know we've calculated that the u.s green new deal for energy it cost about upfront about $7.8 trillion. And that's for everything, transportation, building, heating, cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, fishing. And that, so spending $2 trillion in four years would be an amazing a jolt. Uh, but we're, we'll see if that actually happens. Um, next question, we have plenty of decarbonization solutions for buildings and passenger transport, but a few hard to decarbonize sectors remain. These include long haul transport, aviation and marine, the process industry, chemical sectors and seasonal storage. Uh, true, the, so we think for long haul transport, the, well for short haul aircraft and ships, I think we can go electric, pure electric for medium and long haul, or well, especially long haul will be probably hydrogen fuel cell and for ships and aircraft and uh, for we do have for industries such as the steel industry, there are there's a process now that you can produce steel that involves hydrogen instead of uh, fossil fuels, and that's actually described in the textbook, and that can get you a long way to to decarbonizing steel. But there are challenges, sure, certainly, especially in cement manufacturing, which is also discussed in the book. But there, I think even cement is probably more challenging than steel. And seasonal storage, we technologies exist. There's there's borehole storage, aquifer storage, uh, and uh, and water pit storage or seasonal storage technologies that are already existing for many years in several parts of the world, and those are discussed in the textbook as well. But I think those need to be uh, incremented on a at a faster rate. So I think there it's really doing it on a larger scale. Uh, and before, I think it wasn't done on a larger scale, more because there was just no, no motivation for it. Now there's more motivation. Hopefully, uh, that will happen more. Um, 
Okay, so I'm looking for another question. Can you explain? Uh, can you explain the principal social and political barriers and which are uh, most easily overcome? Uh, well, yeah, the social and political barriers are, well, there's the existing infrastructure and you have a lot of people who are financially invested in the existing infrastructure and you have a lot of lobbyists who will um, promote the existing infrastructure. So that's one thing, it's just overcoming the existing uh, infrastructure and the proponents of it and the financial interests involved. But even, you know, most new energy today is clean renewable energy. There, every year there's more most new energy and there are more and more electric cars being sold. Now with transportation, you know, cars retire after like 15 years or so. And so you can replace, you know, even if you, if you started today, just every new car was electric, you could replace you know, 98, 99% of the cars over, let's say, 20 years. But with uh, power generation, some of these plants will last 40, 50, 60 years. So new, even if, um, well, while new generation can be clean renewable, you have this, you know, stuff that's been built even like five years ago, there's no incentive for it to go out of business. There are still subsidies uh, that these companies receive, the fossil fuel companies still receive there are uh, and still proponents and there's and they're making money so they don't unless there are laws put in place to phase them out uh, they will stay in business so what we need are aggressive laws there, there will be a natural transformation due to the low cost of renewables but we also need aggressive policies to phase out existing infrastructure so getting those policies in place there are social barriers there are political barriers because in every de democratic society uh, votes have to be taken. Some people vote against it because of their uh, because of their interest of their community or or themselves. Um, so another question: uh, Would you walk us through your solutions for covering baseload? Well, the thing is, we don't need baseload power in 100% renewable solution. First of all, demand we need to match demand. That's what we need. Demand is variable; it's intermittent. So baseload power does not meet demand. It just, you know, there might be some minimum demand that it meets, but that, and but there's actually no baseload generator. I mean, to give you an example, I mean, people think that nuclear power is a is a baseload generator, which when it's running, it is. But uh, I don't know about today, but last week, it was 40, like last week at one point, 48% of all the nuclear reactors on the West uh, in Region 4 of the United States. Now, in the United States, there are 100 nuclear reactors. 48% were down. So that's when 48% of all your Region 4 reactors, there are only four regions, so it's about a quarter of all the reactors. One, uh, 50, almost half of them were down, including both in California. And both reactors in California have been down for the last uh, month and a half. Or, well, one was has been down one month and a half. The other's been down like three or three weeks now or so. So, there's no such thing as a perfectly baseload technology. And regardless, you need to match demand. So all these, uh, even nuclear or coal, they need backup or they need peaker plants like hydro or natural gas usually uh, to meet demand. So we have the same problem with renewables. Now renewables are intermittent, but you can combine renewables with demand response. So demand response is very crucial. And I think one of the uh, key policy uh, things that can be, if, if we have laws for more demand response, that that can actually go a long way to keeping the grid stable. So for example, where I live, there are three tiers for prices for electricity. And the cheapest electricity is between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Most expensive is between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. And, but that's good because that gives people incentive to move their like electric car charging to 11 p.m. away from peak times of the day. But, in many states in the US and a lot of places in the world, there's a flat electricity rate all day. So there's no incentive for people to shift the time of their peak electricity demand to a different time. So back to this question, we don't, we don't need baseload. In fact, it, as you get more and more renewables on the grid, baseload becomes more of an encumbrance because then you have to start shutting things off, uh, forcing shutting things off and that can make things more expensive. So it's really by combining renewable generation uh, and expanding the grid to so that when the wind's not blowing in one place, you can get it in another place. So that's one way to kind of make things more smooth is by 
uh, by having like interconnecting uh, geographically dispersed wind and solar and hydro and, and geothermal to smooth out the supply. But then you need storage and demand response uh, to really meet the peaks in demand. And the types of storage, there are lots of types of storage, including, well, hydroelectric dams are the biggest ones. There's pumped hydro, there's concentrated solar power with storage. There's, there's flywheels and batteries and uh, a gravitational mass, which is one that's coming up now. So all these storage technologies are being discussed in the, or discussed in the textbook. <clears throat> and next question. Um, in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change as we know today, the IPCC says we must reduce carbon emissions to the point where we hold global warming to no more than an additional 1.5 degrees Celsius. To do that, we must commit ourselves to reaching net zero carbon by 2050. If you indicate in your book, by what year are you expecting carbon down to zero? Uh, well, our goal is to get it down to zero by 2050, but with 80% by 2030. Now, again, that's so energy is about, I mentioned, 75 to 80% of carbon emissions. So we do need non uh, energy sources in addition to uh, solutions, in addition to the energy solutions. And these are discussed in the book. But uh, yeah, we need at least 80% by 2030, in my mind, of, every, of everything. This includes, including the non energy sources, such as trying to reduce biomass burning trying to reduce um, landfill methane leaks, uh, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, which are uh, these non-energy sources of, of, of green, effectively CO2 equivalent emissions. Uh, question nine, on average, how long will it take for energy suppliers to recoup investments in renewable energy systems? And how often is it cheaper to do so to continue using existing plants? Well, I don't think, I mean, there's, I think there's a range of how long it takes to recoup their investments. I will say on a small scale, I'll give you an example from my own home, which I transitioned. Well, I built this home and it was completed in 2017 and it's all electric, no gas on the property, which saved a lot of money in terms of avoiding a $6,000 permit fee for gas hookup, uh, avoiding pipes, gas pipes for several thousand dollars. But there, you know, it's all it has heat pumps, it has batteries, solar PV, electric cars. The, you know, the solar battery system, the and there are subsidies available. In a lot of places there are subsidies, in a lot of places they're not. But with subsidy, the payback time is five years. Without subsidy, it's 10 years, but the panels are warranted for 25 years. So it's a very fast payback time because it, I have no electric bill, no gasoline bill, no natural gas bill. I get paid because I, do, I generate 20% more electricity than I consume, and I sell that back to the community choice aggregation utility that uh, is in our area. And I get paid at the price at the price that they would sell their generation to consumers at the time of the day. And so it's about $700 a year back. And when you account for that, when you account for the cost savings of not having to pay bills, and the upfront cost savings, in addition to the cost of the equipment, it's about a 10-year uh, payback with no subsidy, five years with subsidy. But that doesn't mean that every wind farm, I mean, if you look at a large scale wind farm or solar farm, I mean, they're, they do their economic analysis but over 20 years that that's, you know, they're gonna make a profit. I, I can't say offhand what their payback time, I think everyone is a little bit different. Okay, so um, weighing, next question, weighing how much carbon trees can suck out of the atmosphere versus how much is released in this in the sort of fires we're now getting could we be investing drones with seed bombs to expand forests with bigger forests alter weather and bring more rain well i think as discussed in the book the only kind of carbon quote carbon capture technology is really natural reforestation and preventing forest loss like preventing biomass burning so certainly expanding forests or trying to grow tree, more trees and trees faster. Uh, you know, we support that. We think that's a good um, use. And you know, there will be, there's an effect on weather of every single thing we do. There's you know, basically the butterfly effect. You know, if a butterfly flaps their wings in one part of the world, it'll affect the weather in the other part of the world. Um, there is this, there's this chaotic variation that occurs. 
uh, that, yeah, so there will be impacts now, whether it's bad or good, it's, it's hard to tell without actually doing modeling or getting observations. But it's, you know, it can't be, we, I mean, we've altered the landscape with, with buildings that cover a few percent of the world's land. And, uh, you know, there's been impacts and we're still surviving, but you know, some are bad impacts, some are good impacts. So I don't want to, I don't think that's a, the metric by which we want to evaluate whether to do that unless we anticipate there'll be horrible impacts. I don't think they will. So Sub-Saharan Africa has lots of potential to embrace and scale up renewables for its energy demands. Which of the renewable options do you think is the best to focus on and build and expand on to steer uh, the continent to energy security? Well, we think every country in the world wants to use a mix of clean renewable energy. Well, there's some exceptions like in Iceland, I don't think we need any solar because there's plenty of um, hydro, geothermal, and wind. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there are there is wind, there is solar, and those are going to be the major ones. Not so much hydro, but um, you know, some a small amount. But it'll be mostly wind and solar, and so those will be the. But we also want storage. Uh, but the, the the resources are good. So in our plans for, uh, I mean, I would suggest to look at for a specific country. You can look at the solutionsproject.org. And there is a drop down menu where, where you can look at, there's a map, you can look at any country in the world, not any, but the ones where we looked at are 143 countries. And that will pop up an energy plan that kind of gives you the mix that we'd propose for each country, including the countries in Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, let's see, there's a question I just joined. Um, I just Joined, so maybe you covered this already. So called SMR, small modular reactors that are in the prototype stage, like New Scale, a little further along. Could you make any comment about this? Here in Canada, the federal government is gung ho on them and will be using uh, public funds to support them. Well, so New Scale, they're, they've contracted with several towns and cities in Utah, for example for a proposed reactor, and it was originally proposed to be available like 2026 or something, but now it's been pushed off till 2029. The budget is basically, I was at 50 or 100% higher than it originally was. And several, the, at least eight of the towns and cities, well, I think seven of them have actually canceled their contracts and one has reduced it significantly. And these, the contracts were originally for only 25% of what they were proposing. So there's really not much buy-in in that new scale project. And it's much more expensive and it's delayed. So this is very reminiscent of uh, traditional nuclear power. It takes forever to build and it's really expensive. So this is not something, we need 80% of the problem solved by 2030. And when we don't, we know that we won't even get one reactor by around then, uh, it can't help solve the problem. And it probably, you know, likely will be delayed even more and it'll probably still be much more expensive than wind and solar. So uh, this is why we call these opportunity costs. So uh, nuclear is an opportunity cost all around. New nuclear is. Existing nuclear, if it doesn't require subsidy, keep it in. If it requires subsidy, shut it down. And so in the United States, there have been several reactors that have asked for subsidy. Some have received them. Uh, but that you can use that money, the subsidy money, just to replace the nuclear with clean renewable energy now. That's much more efficient. New nuclear, why waste time on it when we know it's going to be more expensive, it's going to take longer to build still, and we have these clean renewable energy options. We need to install them as fast as possible. That should be our focus. So any money spent on something that's a worse solution is an opportunity cost. And so that's the position that's in the book, and it applies to SMRs too. Uh, could you please describe why carbon capture technology would not be useful in a bridge for the future? Sure. So carbon capture, well, if it works, but it requires a, an equipment cost for the carbon capture equipment. And then you need energy to run the carbon capture equipment. And where does the energy come from? Well, in the United States, there is one, there was one coal plant that was tied to carbon capture, the Parrish plant in Texas. But the carbon capture equipment 
to run it, they actually built a natural gas plant adjacent to the coal plant just to run the carbon capture equipment. And then they have to mine the natural gas, transport it and burn it. And none of that carbon is captured, only the carbon from the coal plant. But even the carbon from the coal plant that's captured, it wasn't that efficiently, it wasn't efficiently captured, not nearly so efficiently as it was originally thought. And it turned out instead of capturing 90% of carbon, if you account for the natural gas upstream emissions, the combustion emissions, and the uncaptured coal carbon emissions, and then you look at a 20-year time frame, because natural gas is a lot of its leaked methane. If you look at a 20-year time frame, only about 10 to 11 percent of the carbon was being captured average over 20 years. And over 100 years, it's only about 20 percent. So it's nothing close to 90 percent. Then what do they do with the carbon? They ship it, they pipe it to an oil field for an enhanced oil recovery. And there, that carbon gets part of it gets bonded with the oil and sucked up and then the carbon, the oil is burned. And so half that carbon goes back to the air. And we don't even know if the other carbon stays in the ground. So you have no proof whatsoever that any carbon dioxide is actually captured. Plus, because you have natural gas, that increases the, now have natural gas, you have more air pollution emissions because the carbon capture equipment does not eliminate any air pollutants aside from carbon dioxide. And so since you need more natural gas now, that's going to actually increase pollution. So you have worse pollution, you now have more mining. So you don't eliminate any mining or pollution, you actually increase them. And whereas if you took that money, and it cost a billion dollars for that carbon capture equipment in the plant, in the gas plant. So if you took that money and you just replaced the coal with wind or solar, you would not only eliminate the mining associated with the coal and avoid all the natural gas mining, you would eliminate air pollution instead of increasing it, and you would eliminate more carbon. So it turns out, and I did a study on this, looking not only at that, but direct air capture, which has similar problems. Even if you provided the electricity for the carbon capture equipment, wind and solar, it's better used to use that wind and solar to replace the coal in the first place. So there's actually no situation, as long as you have any uh, coal plants or natural gas plants around, there's no situation where it's better to use capture equipment than to just replace the coal or gas. The social cost is always higher. Even when you eliminate all coal and gas plants, then it becomes a question of whether it's cheaper to like reduce biomass burning emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, landfill gas emissions, then carbon capture. And it's, so it's really hard to justify the use of carbon capture because it has such an opportunity cost. Uh, so like, you know, it's, you know, it's really a, unproven and not, um, and it can't, it, it can't even, there's no theoretical, no way, there's no way it can actually uh, be better than just using renewables to replace coal and gas. Okay, so why, next question, why isn't nuclear power part of the power grid solution? Uh, because, well, the main reasons, new nuclear, it takes 10 to 19 years between planning and operation of a new nuclear plant. And many of them are actually closer to 19 years now than 15, than 10 years. And especially there's a plant in Finland, there's a plant in France, there's a, the Hinkley plant, uh, the plants in Georgia. They're all just taking on the order of 15 to 20 years now. And that's way too late. I mean, if we start a new plant today, 2020, if it's not going to be ready till 2035 or later, then you know we need 80% of the solution by 2030. It does not help one bit to have a nuclear plant come up in 2035 when we're spending that money and nothing, there's no benefit for 15 years or longer. So instead, the coal keeps spewing out, the gas keeps spewing out pollution and, and carbon. And so the problem gets worse while you wait around. Meanwhile, like there are some wind and solar farms that go up in four months now, four months, but you know, you know, when they're taking longer, they're maybe a year, year and a half at the most. But uh, they're like, you can put up wind and solar much faster. Wind and solar are now the cheapest forms of new electricity, according to Lazard's cost of energy, onshore wind and utility solar are almost half the cost of natural gas. And so it's it's cheaper and nuclear is like one is five times more expensive than utility solar right now, new nuclear that is. So it's way expensive. And so you get much less energy benefit for the same, you get one fifth the energy output and 15 years later, 
with a new nuclear power plant, not to mention the waste issues, the meltdown issues. I mean, one and a half percent of all nuclear reactors ever built to date have melted down. There's the weapons proliferation issues. There's the uranium mining issue related to cancer from radon. And you know, so there are a lot of problems with nuclear that it's just um, energy security and cost and uh, delays. So next, uh, my question is about timing. UNEP says humanity's GHG emissions have to fall 55% or 32 gigawatt or gigatons of CO2 by 2030 under ideal conditions with no budgetary constraints and direct federal incentives investment. How much of that reduction can come from scaling up renewable energy? Well, if we can replace, I mean, our goal is to replace the entire world's energy infrastructure with clean renewable energy. And that would, and that's about 75 to 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions are associated with that, and about 90% of all pollutants, air pollutants. So, and then we do need to address the non-energy emissions too. Uh, so yeah, by 2030, well, our plans have been 80% by 2030, and this question asks about 55% by 2030. So yeah, we're more aggressive than UNEP, uh, and, but we, but if we could scale, if we could be more, in terms of if we, get 80% of all energy by 2030, then there's some wiggle room with the non-energy emissions. This can possibly be del delayed later to meet this 55% this of all CO2 by 2030. Um, but I would propose, we wanna get rid of everything as fast as possible. So there's, I would not delay anything. Um, next question, there were, was talk 10 years ago about reducing military reliance on fossil fuels. What's the status of that and how much of the military could go green now? Interestingly, we did a study. I have a student who just got his PhD and he was in the, he's in the military. And he just did a study, can the, of the US military transition, actually well as the US Army is focused on, transition to 100% renewables? And the answer is yes, and it would save a lot of money. Uh, we actually looked at all the individual vehicles, combat vehicles, tanks, fighter planes, you know, trains, trucks. We even looked at a jet, jumbo jet 747. And we found, we looked at a very significant deal that first of all, it's technically possible to, to transition all the vehicles. And keep in mind that military needs, you can't have much wiggle room in terms of the volume of tanks and because you have to fit through certain uh, tunnels and go on certain bridges so you have to have, can't exceed certain weights and volumes can't be too big uh, it turns out you can transition everything in the military and you could and we also looked at army bases remote bases and bases in the u.s and found that it was possible to transition all these bases too at reasonable cost because you save right now if you look at the current system it takes like seven gallons of diesel to ship in one gallon of diesel to Afghanistan, for example, and, and then a lot of people die on the way due to landmines. And so by transitioning to a microgrid where, where you're locally producing energy can, turns out can save a lot. And so we think it's possible to transition militaries as well. Now that's where you get into social and political barriers. So technically it's possible, but there is a social and political barriers to getting this through and there, you know, a lot of testing has to be done to make sure it works. Uh, next question, what percent of total clean energy solutions should be hydrogen? Well, the main area that hydrogen will be useful will be in long distance heavy transport, like long distance ships and trains and, and uh, aircraft, some um, trucks. Uh, and so other sectors, you know, in some electricity, like for microgrids, remote microgrids, where you can provide electricity and heat from hydrogen, that will be useful. Um, but, you know, but electricity, hydrogen for normal electricity is probably, it's, it's not so competitive as batteries uh, right now, but there are probably some situations where you can use hydrogen. Because if you use electricity to produce hydrogen and then use the hydrogen back in a fuel cell to reproduce electricity, that's you lose a lot of energy compared to using electricity to put it in a battery and then extracting the electricity from the battery. So there's an efficiency loss, but there are some situations where hydrogen for electricity in normal grids, not microgrids, uh, might be useful. 
but it's on the order of because it's mostly long distance heavy transport and transport's only I don't know, 25% or so, maybe it was 30% of all energy. You know, we're talking on the order of 10% of, of all energy. Uh, it could be hydrogen. I Don't quote me on that number, but there, we do have the numbers in our, especially the 143 country paper, and in, it should be in the textbook as well. Um, next question, what role do you see for community choice aggregation in adoption of a distributed energy resource and the consequent deployment of clean energy storage efficiency and demand response? Well, my experience with community choice aggregation or CCAs, it's, they're amazing because they can procure 100% renewable electricity for any consumer. So if you live in an apartment complex where you can't put your own solar on your roof, you can sign up with the CCA. Well, there are seven states in the US that have CCAs and these should be expanded in my mind to other countries where, because the CCA can not only procure 100% clean renewable electricity, but they can also yeah, procure storage options and, uh, and encourage people to get off natural gas. That's another, that's another big push in communities is to ban the use of natural gas in new construction and try to transition away from it. And these CCAs actually can be instrumental. They can give people incentives to just electrify everything. And so I think they do play, they can play and already have played a big role in transition in California and a few other states. And I know in the last election, I think Ohio and New Jersey, uh, they strengthened their CCAs to allow them to procure 100% renewable so that those two laws passed. Next question, uh, we'd love to hear Mark's perspective on what's needed in energy storage to power the world. So, well, just more storage, the better. Um, Certainly there are new technologies that are making headway. I mean, batteries are coming down in cost and ideally, you know, if batteries were really, really cheap, that's like the perfect solution because they're very, they don't take up much space and uh, they're, you know, you can put them pretty much anywhere. There are technologies like gravitational storage with solid masses that um, are becoming commercialized. And I think they have a prominent role those are basically where you, when you have extra wind or solar, you can use it to like lift a concrete block or push up a train up a hill. When you need electricity, you lower the concrete block or you let the train roll down the hill. It's just like pumped hydro storage. It's very simple and it works. You know, it's a question of what's the actual cost in the commercialized ventures. Um, okay, so let me, I don't have any time. I only have a few minutes left. Let me just jump to the next question really quickly. Um, are hydro and tidal accounted as 100% renewables? Well, in our program, yeah, they're they're included in our wind, water, solar, hydro. Well, existing hydroelectric is included uh, in our plans. We we have not proposed we, in our 143 country plans, for example, we do not propose any new hydro in terms of new dams, but existing hydro and run of the river hydro. Uh, so using existing hydro more efficiently is considered uh, part of the renewable. Tidal power is also uh, considered part of the 100% renewables, although we, there's not a lot of it. And, you know, it's a real still a question of how much we're actually going to, uh, if the cost will come down and if it will be large, widely commercialized. Um, two more questions and I think I'll wrap up. Uh, assuming then new submit, administration agrees what would it cost for california to convert to 100 percent wind water solar and what is the cost of the business as usual uh, i don't remember off the top but we do have a paper on california our california 100 percent wind water solar plan which was back in 2014 so you can i think you could start with those numbers which um, you can get all of our papers from my website uh, although it's a little tricky if you want to send me an email i can send you give you the links directly but there is some numbers there and you could probably account for the fact that costs have dropped since 2014 quite a bit. So I'd say maybe a third or half of that or a third less or half of that. Next question, what growth rates would we need for renewables to achieve 80% by 2030? Well, I guess we need 8% per year <laughs> by, uh, for the next 10 years. So yeah, we, we do need as, as fast as possible. That's basically the bottom line. We need to do this as fast as possible. So, but setting goals is important for like, it's like the carrot in front of the horse. We got to set a goal and then we just do as much as we can, as fast as we can. That's my suggestion. 
All right. Well, I think um, yeah, I think that's the last question that's listed here. I, um, you're welcome to send me additional questions. Um, if you could limit the number, that would be I'd really appreciated. But please send me an email to. Uh, well, I think you can send it to Cambridge, and they'll send it to me. And uh, for additional questions, yeah, and there's they just posted uh, their email on there. But if you can limit it to just you know one to two or three questions, no more than three questions, that would be great. Um, since I'm sure there'll be a lot more. Thank you all for attending, and I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I hope we all can work together to get to this clean renewable energy future and solve these major pollution and climate problems. Yeah, I really appreciate you attending. Thanks. Thank you.